Good morning, Bereans. Appreciate you being here this morning. For the next several weeks, probably five, don't hold me to that, but I think five, we're going to be teaching on the distinctive doctrines held by Berean Bible Church. This Berean Bible Church. Now, by the word distinctive, distinctive means characteristic of one person or thing, and so serving to distinguish it from others. So for the next several weeks, we'll be looking at the doctrines that Berean Bible Church holds that distinguish us from mainstream Christianity. Now, these teachings are going to be talking about just our distinctives, all right? The other doctrines that we hold to are normative to evangelical Christianity, doctrines such as the inspiration of Scripture. I mean, we believe that all Scripture is verbally inspired as originally written and therefore infallible and inerrant. We don't hold to the view that the Bible contains the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. If you say it contains the Word of God, then you sit in judgment on the Bible of what is God's Word and what is not. The Bible is God's Word. All right? We believe the living and true God, Yahweh, exists in three persons. The Trinity, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. We believe that Yahweh was born of a virgin. We believe that Christ rose bodily from the dead and ascended unto God the Father. We believe that all men are born with an inherent depraved nature and are lost sinners in need of salvation. We believe that men are saved and justified when they recognize themselves as sinners and put their trust in Christ as the Son of God and His finished work on the cross of Calvary. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. Now, as I said, these are pretty much the basic doctrines of the evangelical church, the Orthodox church. Now, beyond those doctrines, there are five distinctives that Berean Bible Church holds to that I want to cover these. And I want to cover them in what I see as their order of importance. Okay, so we're going to start out with the most important today, free grace, and work our way through the rest of them. All right, now, when I talk about free grace, you might be thinking, what's so distinctive about that? I mean, grace is obviously free. Yes, it is, but when we say free grace... We're saying that and we're using that term in opposition to the teaching of lordship salvation. All right? Now, the issue here is one of soteriology. All right? Soteriology comes from the Greek term soter, which means savior, and logos, which means word, reason, or principle. So soteriology is a study of the doctrine of salvation. I don't think anything's more important than this, and that's why I'm starting with this one. This is about salvation. Soteriology discusses how Christ's death secures the salvation of those who believe. And it helps us to understand the doctrines of redemption, of justification, of sanctification, of propitiation, and the substitutionary atonement. Now, within the professing church, there are two main views of soteriology. You have Arminian and Calvinist. Arminian is someone who thinks that man is responsible in the decision of salvation. They believe that the individual makes the choice as to whether to be saved or not. On the other hand, a Calvinist is someone who believes that salvation is of the Lord. They believe that it is God who chooses who will be saved. Now, within evangelical churches, there's an ongoing debate on this issue of salvation. Is it by the choice of man, his free will, or is it by God's sovereign choice? Now, within these two views are two other views that can be called lordship salvation and free grace. I believe that most Calvinists and Arminians hold to the lordship view. I think that's kind of the predominant view within the church. But among Calvinists and Arminians, there also are some who hold to the free grace. So this is kind of divided here, but I'd say the majority would go to the Lordship Salvation. Now, which of these views is any does the Bible teach? That's what we want to look at. That's what's really important. Which of these positions, free grace or Lordship Salvation, is biblical soteriology? We as believers need to hold to a theological position. 
We need a framework. We need a grid or a filter to put things through when we hear them. And this grid or framework must be formed from a study of the Word of God. So all theology, everything that you believe, needs to come from exegesis. That's drawing out of the text. We need to, what we believe needs to come from the text. When we take our ideas and we impose them on the text, that's called eisegesis. All right, that's forcing something there that's not there. So we need to allow the Bible to speak and then shape our theology from the Scripture. Does that sound weird? <laughs> I mean, that, that's where we need to get our views, from the Bible. And let me tell you something. If you find that the Scriptures speak against your theology, change your theology. Don't mess with the Scriptures. Okay, don't try to twist and distort the Scripture. Just line up with what God says. That's the important thing. If you care about the Word of God, just line up with it, no matter where it takes you. All right, let's examine these views in light of Scripture. We at Berean Bible Church hold to a Calvinistic soteriology. All right? And we'll talk about this next week. But within Calvinism, there are two views that are very important and very different. We want to spend our time this morning looking at these two different views. The Lordship view is probably the most widely accepted of the views among Reformed thinkers. I don't know why this is. It doesn't make sense to me. But this is the truth. So those who hold the Lordship theology believe that if a person is really a Christian, they must live a righteous, holy, obedient life. And without this practical righteousness, there's no reason for a person to think they're a Christian. See, the Lordship theology says, well, they're doing this and they're doing... They, they really can't be a Christian. Okay, that's a Lordship position. Now listen, please listen carefully. I am not saying that obedience is not important. If you know me, if you've heard my teaching, you know it is very important. I am saying that obedience is not necessary for salvation. As a Christian, you're called to be obedient. But we are saved through faith, not obedience. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary on the Sermon of the Mount, says this, Nothing is more dangerous than to rely only upon a correct belief and a fervent spirit. And assume that as long as you believe the right things and are zealous and keen and active concerning them, you are therefore of necessity a Christian. <laughs> Nothing's more dangerous than just relying on faith. A correct belief. Really? That's a dangerous position. You see what he's saying? Being a Christian is more than just believing the right things. You've got to have obedience. Now, he's not alone in this view. According to Lordship Salvation, saving faith includes submission, obedience, repentance, you go on and on, okay? It depends on who's doing it. There's a lot of different things they'll add to this to determine whether you're a Christian or not. Richard Belcher says this, true saving faith includes in it a submission to the Lordship of Christ. Okay, submission to Christ. We would say, well, what's wrong with that, right? We're to submit to Christ. Okay, so then if you're a Christian, you live in submission to Christ. Completely, totally, right? Another Lordship proponent says this, Saving faith is trust in Christ Himself. It is a commitment of self in submission to all of Christ that is revealed. So I'm totally submissive to Christ. Now listen, let me just say this. I held this view, Lordship, for a long time, a miserably long time. Because as one of the things that Lordship theology does, it turns everybody into Pharisees because they are judging, they are evaluating everybody else around them to see if they truly can, you know, be a Christian or not. I know, like I said, I've been there. And I, I'll tell you, the, the freedom I received from this one, uh, my view changed, was absolutely incredible. John MacArthur says this, Saving faith, then, is the whole of my being, embracing all of Christ. Faith cannot be divorced from commitment. Hmm. 
Okay, I would say commitment to what? How much commitment? Total commitment? He also says, the true test of faith is this. Does it produce obedience? If not, it's not saving faith. Again, I would say, okay, obedience, what do you mean? A little obedience, some obedience, mostly obedience, all obedience? What, what do you, how do you define that? Bailey Smith asserts this. Saving faith is not mere intellectual assent, but it involves an act of submission on our part. So those who hold to the Lordship view would say that true Christians live a life characterized by obedience to all that the Father commanded. Does that trouble you? <laughs> Are you questioning your salvation? Please get this. Please understand this. Yeshua is the only person who ever lived in complete obedience to the Father. The only one ever. All other men have sinned. And the only reason that any person can get into heaven is because Yeshua's obedience is imputed to their account by faith. This verse has to be my favorite verse. For as by the one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners. So, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now, the word made here is the Greek word kathistemi, and it means to set down in rank or to place in the category of, to appoint to a particular class. The word made is not causative. It is declarative. Very important distinction. Those in Adam were declared sinners. It's imperative that we understand this. For as by the one man's disobedience, Adam disobeyed, the many were made sinners. He doesn't say they were made sinful, but they were made, they were declared sinners. See, the whole human race has been constituted legally as sinners. That's our judicial standing before God, and it's based entirely and solely on Adam's one act of disobedience. God decreed that the whole human race should be represented by the first man and should suffer the consequence of that man's actions. Now, before you start yelling, that's not fair. We all sin in Adam, and with Adam, because he was our federal head. He represented us. Therefore, God pronounced all to be sinners. That's one side of the equation. But thank God there's another side. So, the great truth that we see here is that we are and have come out of the obedience. All we are, all we have comes out of the obedience of the last Adam. The Lord Yeshua. Our salvation is based entirely on Him and from Him and in Him. And my being a sinner, as my being a sinner came entirely from being an Adam, all my righteousness comes entirely from the Lord Yeshua the Christ. His righteousness is my righteousness. You have to understand that. All He is and has, you are and have because you are in Him by faith. Your assurance of salvation comes not from your feelings, but from your understanding of your identity in Christ. Look at yourself in Adam. Though you had really done nothing wrong, you were declared a sinner. And look at yourself in Christ. And you see, though you had done nothing good, you were declared to be righteous. That's the parallel. We need to get rid of all thoughts that our actions gain us or keep us salvation. We are made righteous because one man's obedience. The obedience of Yeshua and Yeshua alone. He lived a sinless life in total obedience to the law of God, and then he died a substitutionary death on our behalf, and the many will be made righteous. I'm righteous because of Christ. The people who the Father has given to Christ are made righteous. Now, the word made here, again, is kathisami, and it means to set down in rank, to place in the category of, to appoint to a particular class. The word is the same meaning on both sides of this equation here, this parallel. We are made righteous on the grounds of Christ's obedience alone. That's it. 
So when people say, well, you have to keep the law to get to heaven, I do. I keep it perfectly in Christ. Christ kept the law. I'm in Him. I keep righteous. All right? I'm righteous because of Him. That's why anyone can get to heaven, because we have Christ's righteousness. You can't get there on your own righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake He made Him, Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Positionally, people, in our standing before God, I am completely righteous and totally obedient because I'm in Christ. That's not my practice. That's my position. Christ's obedience and righteousness have been imputed to my account. That's my position. That's my standing. But when people talk about obedience, when the Lord's people talk about obedience being necessary to enter heaven, they're referring to practical obedience, how you live your life, what you do. Not your position before God. John MacArthur writes this, Hell is undoubtedly full of people who did not actively oppose Jesus Christ, but simply drifted into damnation by neglecting to respond to the gospel. Such people are in view in Hebrews 2, 1-4. through They are aware of the good news of salvation provided by Jesus Christ, but aren't willing to commit their lives to Him. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, these people, he said, they're not believers because they didn't commit. So what do they lack? They don't lack faith. He's saying they lack commitment. Then he gives this story to illustrate his point. He says this. He says, I'll never forget a particular lady who came into my office and informed me that she was a prostitute. She said, I need help. I'm desperate. So I presented the claims of Christ to her. Then I said to her, would you like to invite Jesus Christ into your life? And I'm like, where do you get that from? Is that in the Bible? You invite Jesus? Would you come on in? The Bible says believe, trust, not inviting anybody into your heart or anything like that. She said yes, and she prayed. I said, now I want you to do something. Do you have your book with you of your contacts? And she said, yeah, I do. He said, let's light a match to it and burn it. And she looked at me and said, what do you mean? I said, if you want to live for Jesus Christ, if you've truly accepted His forgiveness and met Him as your Savior, then you need to prove it. So she's not really a Christian until she proves it, I guess. You know, she prayed, she believed, but she has to prove to John, I guess, that she, you know, prove it. Prove that you believe. And she said to me, that book's worth a lot of money. I don't want to burn it. She put it back in her purse and looked right at, right, looked me in the eye and says, I guess I don't really want Jesus, do I? And then she left. Well, she felt that way because he made her feel that way. MacArthur then said this. When it came down to counting the cost, she wasn't ready. I don't know what the outcome of that poor woman has been. I do know that she knew the facts and believed them, but she was not willing to make the sacrifice. So she knew the gospel. She believed. He said, she, I presented the gospel. She believed it, but she had to make a sacrifice. What, I thought Christ was our sacrifice, but we need to make a sacrifice. Lord, I believe you, but I'm not saved yet because I have to sacrifice something. Does a person need to commit? They need to sacrifice? They need to count the cost in order to be saved? This is the gospel that these lordship people are preaching. This is a gospel of damnation. It's putting the thing on people. You have to do this. you got to make it good. Look at Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who's thirsty, come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. You know what you need? You just got to be thirsty. You got to know you need it. And then it's free. Does that sound like a call to commitment or sacrifice? It doesn't to me. Here's the, here's the issue, people. If obedience, commitment, and sacrifice are involved in salvation, how much is needed? Okay, we have to believe the gospel, but then we also have to commit. We have to be obedient. We have to sacrifice. My first question is, how much? How much obedience is, obedience is required? That's what they'll say. How much? 
Don't you want to know that? I mean, that's kind of important, right? Is 80% good enough? I mean, 80%, that's a lot of obedience, right? I mean, I'm doing pretty good. I'm only 20%. Oh, you say no. How about 90? Will 90 work? I mean, that's a pretty good obedience record there. How, does it take 95%? Oh, my word. Listen, listen, we, it can't be 100 because nobody does that. I don't think too many people do 95 or 90. All right, so th these are the questions you have to ask, and here is the problem. Nobody can answer these questions. I've asked people, I've gone up to people after messages and say, can I ask you a question? You're talking about the importance of obedience. How much? And they look at you like you're crazy. How much obedience? 100%? Because I'm not going to make it if it's 100%. And then, they, then you, you, know, you just get that deer in the headlights look because they can't answer the question. No. There's a number. You just got to know what it is and no one knows what it is. How much obedience is enough? Which means that we never really know if we're doing enough. Which means we never really know if we're going to make it to heaven if it's based on obedience or sacrifice or commitment. If complete obedience to the will of God is necessary for salvation, then I think we're all in trouble. Okay? Notice what Paul said. 1 John 3.11 For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Okay, you get this, right? We're commanded in Scripture to love one another. That's a command. And just in case you're confused, let me show you what that looks like. Love is patient. It's kind. Whoa, kind? Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. Really? It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Will a person who is not loving others 100% perish? I mean, obviously they're not being 100% obedient. Do you see how complicated it gets when you require obedience as, as a necessary element of salvation? The Lordship view has become very widespread in the church today. But I think it's very unbiblical. And at issue here with the Lordship view and with the free grace view are basically three things that are at issue here. First of all, the nature of faith. What, what really is faith? The relationship between faith and assurance and the effect of salvation. In other words, the debate centers around what must a person do to be saved? What actually do they, have, do they have to do? What must a person do to know they're saved? And thirdly, how will salvation show itself in someone's life? This is the issue. This is the debate here. So let's look at the first one, the nature of faith. What must a person do to be saved? Well, first of all, what exactly is saving faith? What is it? Saving faith is, you ready for this? Understanding and assent to the propositions of the gospel. That means you hear the gospel, you understand it, I heard it, I understand, and you believe it. Do you understand some things that you don't believe? Sure you do. I hope so. You understand things. People tell you this, this, this. Now, I understand what you're saying. I don't believe it. Okay? So it's understanding. You can't believe the gospel if you don't understand it. You have to hear it, you have to understand it, and then you believe it. It's not some special kind of faith in the sense that its quality or essence is different than other kinds of faith. There's not, you know, different A, A faith and B faith and C faith. There's not different faiths. There's not different kinds of faith. faith. There is just different objects of faith. What is your faith placed in? The object of our faith is Christ. We all know what faith is. For example, if I said... Jeff told me that the check is in the mail, and I believe him. That's faith, right? Because I have no way to verify if that's really in the mail. I didn't see him put it in. I don't, it gets lost in the mail. Could be, who knows? You know, I don't, I, I, so I believe him. Why do I believe him? Because I know him. So I, he said it, I believe him. Now, are you going to ask me, well, did you believe him with your head or your heart? 
Does that sound stupid? But oh, have you seen the gospel track? Missing heaven by 18 inches. You believe with your head and not your heart. And then people are scratching their heads saying, how do I believe with my blood pumping organ? How do you I believe with that? You don't. It's a muscle. You believe with your mind, with your thoughts. You believe something, okay? We have so messed up, you know, Christianity with our little slogans and little things that it's just, it's ridiculous, people. You're not going to ask me, did I believe in my head or my heart? You understand when I say I believe, do you understand what I mean? When it comes to Christianity, we look for some kind of, some kind of other understanding of faith. Faith is faith, whether it's Christianity or something someone else says. Saving faith is taking God at His word. It's believing what God said. That's it. God said this, hey, I believe it. Look at Romans 4. 20 through 21. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that what God was able to do, that God was able to do what he had promised. So God made Abraham a promise and Abraham said, I believe that. I believe what God said. I believe he can do what he said he'd do. That was faith. Look at 1 John 5, 9 through 13. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. But this is the testimony of God that He is born concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony Himself. Whoever does not believe God has made Him a liar, because He has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning His Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever is the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, verse 9 is saying that we accept human testimony, and we do. How much more can we accept God's testimony? It's not that the faith that receives it's greater. The testimony is greater. It's more reliable. And if I believe God's testimony about His Son, I receive God's righteousness. I have everlasting life. Now, please understand this. I am not saying that everyone who says they're a Christian is one. Okay? I'm saying everyone who believes the gospel is a Christian. You can say you're a Christian because you live in America. Right? Everybody in America, well, used to be, used to be a Christian. Now it's not that way. All right? But I know so many people think they're Christians, okay? Okay? Anybody dies, ah, oh, they're in a better place. Really? Maybe not. Okay? It's kind of universalism. I was talking to a man, and he told me he was a Christian. And I wasn't sure about that, so I asked him a question. I said, look, if you were to die right now and stand before God, and God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? And he looked kind of up, and he thought for a minute, and he says, I'm not sure. He says, I haven't been to confession lately. Usually people will say, well, I have done this, or I have done, they'll list accomplishments. Okay, then you know they're on the wrong track, right? This man said he was a Christian, but he had no clue what the Bible taught about salvation. So I proceeded to share the gospel with him, and he seemed interested in it. I didn't get him to sign a card or walk an aisle or pray a prayer, because that's not what it's about. It's what you either believe or you don't believe. Now, the Lordship view has redefined saving faith so it's more than just taking God at His word. To them, saving faith involves surrender, commitment, submission, repentance, sacrifice. And these additions are both linguistically invalid and biblically invalid. Faith is simply believing. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And someone's going to say, oh, I'll look at the rest of the verse. Whoever does not obey. See, I knew obedience was important. If you don't obey, whoever does not obey the Son will not see life. What's going on with this verse? Well, it's a translation thing here, okay? The word that's translated does not obey in the ESV and the New American Standard is translated does not believe in the King James and the New King James. The verb here is Apitheo. Now, okay, so what does that mean? Well, the leading 
Greek lexicon of the New Testament, which is Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Danker, make a very insightful comment about apitheo, which sheds light, I think, on John 3.36. They say this, Since in the view of the early Christians, the supreme disobedience was a refusal to believe their gospel, apitheo may be restricted in some passages to the meaning disbelieve, be an unbeliever. So it's saying whoever doesn't believe. That's the idea because to them that was the most sincere form of disobedience. You didn't believe the gospel. Uh, you didn't obey. A person who trusts in Christ alone obeys completely the will of the Father in Yeshua the Christ alone for their eternal salvation. Augustine, who lived from 354 to 430, wrote this. Faith is nothing else than to think with assent. John Calvin wrote this, For as regards justification, faith is something merely passive, bringing nothing of ours to the recovering of God's favor, but receiving from Christ what we lack. Look at John 20, uh, 20 30, and 31. Now Yeshua did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But, if, but these are written, these signs that are in the book are written so that you may believe that Yeshua is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Okay, so these, the book of John was written so you would believe, the signs were given so you'd believe these signs, and by believing you'd have life. Now, believing that Yeshua is the Christ is not mere verbalization of the phrase that saves you. We must believe that Yeshua the Christ is who the Bible says He is, which means we must understand what the Bible says about Him. In 1 John 5.1 it says, Everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Christ has been born of God. We must believe that Yeshua is the Christ in the Johannian sense of the term. We must understand Christ as John does. So how does John understand Christ? What, do we, what is it that we have to believe? Well, in John 11, 25-27, Yeshua said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, Yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So, in verse 27, Mary says she believes the very thing that the Gospel of John was written to bring her to faith in. In verse 26, Yeshua said, Do you believe this? What's the this? Well, it's the statement that Yeshua made about himself in verse 25. I'm the resurrection and life. So he tells her that he's the resurrection and life. But that's not all he asked her to believe. Yeshua is saying, I guarantee resurrection and life to everyone who believes in me. To believe that Yeshua is the Christ is in essence to believe that he is the guarantor of eternal life to everyone who trusts him. So, if I can make people understand what it means to believe that Yeshua is the Christ, they'll either believe or they won't. The Lordship view presents faith as if it were, I have all the facts, I believe them, now i got to do something with them. Like there's an extra step, right? Like the prostitute, there's an extra step. you got to sacrifice. There's an act of the will, a surrender, a commitment, a sacrifice. That, people, is not biblical. Romans 4, 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly is faith, is counted as righteousness. Faith is accepting the testimony of God. Do you believe that Yeshua is the Christ? If you do, then on the testimony of Scripture, you're saved. You possess eternal life. Benjamin Warfield, the Presbyterian who probably would not have put himself in my camp on this issue, says this, the saving power resides exclusively not in the act of faith or the attitude of faith or the nature of faith, but in the object of faith. See, the truth is, now technically, we're not saved by faith. We are saved through faith. Okay, hang on to that. Listen, for by grace you have been saved through faith. In other words, faith is the instrumental means. Grace is the efficient means of our salvation. We're saved by Yeshua. We're saved by His grace, but we are saved through faith. 
Now, I think you'd understand what I meant if I said to you, I put the fire out with the hose. Now, do you picture me with the hose over there smacking the fire and, you know, trying to knock the fire out? No, you understand, right? Hoses are channels for water to come through to put the fire out. The hose is the instrumental means. The water is the efficient means. So faith is the instrumental means by which we are able to access our salvation through Yeshua the Christ. John Robbins, in the forward to Gordon Clark's book, Faith and Saving Faith, which I highly recommend Clark's book, Faith and Saving Faith. Clark was as reformed as you get, and he basically is presenting this type of argument in that book that faith is simply believing the truth of God. It's not about doing this or doing that. Well, Robbins says this in the book. Belief of the truth, nothing more and nothing less, is what separates the saved from the damned. Those who maintain there is something more than belief are quite literally beyond belief. Now, see, if you hold to that truth, then it's all about faith, and how do you know how to judge your neighbor? You look at them, and they're, not, they're doing this, but they say they're a Christian. Oh, what, you're going to put their actions against their word? All right, let me give you a test. All right, see if you understand this. Take out a pencil and piece of paper. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would, be put, they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So the authorities, the Jewish authorities, some of them believed in him. Now let me ask you something. Were these individuals saved? Were they Christians? The Lordship of you would say no. They didn't confess him. How could they be saved if they didn't confess him? Well, why does the Scripture say they believe? It doesn't say they pretended to believe. They thought they believed. They acted like they... There's none of those things. They just said the Bible says they believe. Now, this is going to be hard to believe, but Mark Copeland, who is the author of the Executable Outlines, says this about this text in John. There are some who teach that as long as one believes in Jesus, they'll be saved. I think the Bible teaches that, okay? But watch, that salvation is by faith only. He says, but there is such a thing as an unsaved believer. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. This is the verse. The verse is in John. He says, there were some who believed in Jesus, but they weren't saved. Well, wait a minute. Then how do we get saved? So is he saying they would have got saved if they would have confessed? See, so they weren't saved by believing. They had to take an extra step. This is the Lordship position. There is such a thing as an unsaved believer. You talk about confusing. He goes on to say this. Let no one think that just because they believed in Jesus, they have a free ticket to heaven. How do you get this? See, the ticket is not free, basically, what he's saying. You've got to earn this ticket, okay? You're not getting no free ride. Really? Wow. This is, again, he's putting out the executable outlines that all these people are reading and, you know, following. And, yeah, yeah, we've got we to gotta do something. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He doesn't come into judgment. But he's passed from death to life. You get eternal life by faith. But here's the thing. Lordship theology causes people to doubt the testimony of Scripture. Faith is believing, and believing alone makes you a Christian. But Lordship salvation was saying, no, 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 you've got to add some stuff to that. Look at Acts 8, the text that Jeremy read this morning. And when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God, and the name of Yeshua the Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. Oh, cool, Simon. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing the signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, the words believe and believed are used 37 times in Acts, and they clearly refer to those who have trusted Christ. Okay, Acts 10, 43 
To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. Acts 13.39 And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So, again, when the Bible uses this word believes, it means one thing. They don't, the Bible doesn't talk about a, a fake belief or a, you know, a not enough belief or anything like that. Okay? The Word of God says that Simon believed. To say that he didn't believe, in my mind, is to question inspiration. Notice what the text in Acts goes on to say, though. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Say, hey, give me this power also so that anyone who I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord. If possible, the, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And because of Simon's actions and Peter's proclamation, many will say, well, he wasn't a Christian. Simon, see, he really wasn't a Christian. Well, I got a problem because it says Simon himself believed. Not he pretended to believe. He acted like he believed. He made believe. He believed. Now, are we going to take the Bible at its word or not? Why would the Bible say that if he really didn't believe? It, it has ways of saying he pretended to believe, but the Bible doesn't understand that because it he just believed. You either believe or not. You don't. Now, here's the thing. Referring to this text, John MacArthur <laughs> writes this. If that passage teaches anything, if it teaches anything at all, it surely teaches there's such a thing as non-saving faith. Faith that doesn't save. Okay, now I'm just lost. I'm in all this trouble because I believe, but how do I know if it's the good faith or not the good faith? How do I know if my faith is saving faith or it's non-saving faith? See, we've got two different kinds of faith. But... I don't know where in the Bible it distinguishes one from another. Now, they would say the thing that makes your faith real is your obedience. So my actions make my faith what it is. Faith that does not save. How do we know if our faith is real? How do we know we're Christians? Now, I use MacArthur a lot because, you know, he's a leading preacher in the country. He's written many books big lordship pusher. Uh, the Bible, Bible Broadcasting Network in this area took MacArthur off the radio years ago because of this very reason. And man, I commended them. They said he is hurting Christians with this stuff. He's making Christians think they're not even Christians because you've got to be perfect in his view to be a Christian. The lordship view says he can't be saved because there's no commitment, no sacrifice, no good works, but the scripture says he believed. So you have to make a choice. Who are you going to believe? <laughs> the Bible? Or what men say about the Bible? Okay, let's stick with the Bible. All right, let's move on to point two, the relationship between faith and assurance. In other words, what must a person do to know he's saved? Okay, you've trusted Christ. How do you know you're saved? The Lordship view teaches that assurance comes from obedience. So you know you're saved when you see all these good things you do. You're so wonderful. Okay? You see your holy living? Martin Luther said this. For certainty does not come to me from any kind of reflection on myself and my state. On the contrary, it comes solely through hearing the word, solely because I cling to the word and its promises. Okay? So he says, I'm not looking at myself and saying, oh, I know I'm saved. Look how good I am. John Calvin wrote this, and I love this. And in case you didn't know, Calvin was a Calvinist. Okay? <laughs> He wasn't the first. Augustine was the first Calvinist. Car Calvin got his stuff from Augustine, but we don't use that. We usually use the term Calvin. So John Calvin taught this. From one's work, conscience feels more fear and consternation than assurance. Now, to me, that is so on the mark. If you are an honest person, you look at your life and you say, that doesn't give me a lot of assurance. That makes me fear. That, that scares me. Yeah. Amen, Calvin. 
if good works are the basis of assurance, then the believer's eyes are distracted from the sufficiency of Christ in his work to meet their eternal needs, and our eyes are focused on ourselves. I'm not looking to Christ, I'm looking to my works. If I seek assurance through examining my good works, then one of two things must necessarily result. Okay, think about this. Number one, I'm going to minimize the depth of my sinfulness. I'm going to say, you know, I know I do that, but that's not that bad. I'm a Christian, so it's not really that bad. Okay, so I get my assurance because I'll just say, that's not, ah, that's, a, that's a baby sin. Okay, so I'm okay. The second position is this. I will see my deep sinfulness as hopelessly contrary to any conviction that I am saved. I'll look at my life and I'll be honest and I'll say, how in the world can I be a Christian and do that? And so now I just feel like I'm lost because I believed. I believed, but obviously it didn't take, it didn't work because I'm still sinning. And if I'm sinning, I can't be a Christian, so therefore I'm hopeless. People, our assurance is to be based on God's word. His promise that he would give eternal life to all who believe in his son. And assurance does not come from our works. It comes from believing what God said. God said, if you believe, you have eternal life. I did believe. I have eternal life. Amen. In Corinthians, Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I used to look at that verse and I'd hear the te Lordship teaching and I'd say, all things are not new. Oh, there's still a lot of old things in my life. I don't know if I'm a Christian and struggle and wrestle with this until I came to understand the, ver the verse is talking about my position. My position in Christ. All things are new. The old have passed away. I'm in Christ now. Let's move on to our third point, the effects of salvation. How will salvation show itself in one's life? Well, the Lordship view teaches that Christians cannot apostatize. They can't fall away from God. They must and will produce fruit. No fruit, no root. Okay? Is that true? You ever seen a fruit tree that, if it doesn't have fruit, does that mean it doesn't have a root? There's some seasons trees don't produce fruit. Okay? I got an oak tree, and some years I got tons of acorns, and other times I have no acorns some years. I, so when there's no acorns, I can assume all the roots are gone. Right? Well, it's ridiculous, people. But they say, boy, you got to produce fruit. Okay? Listen. If heaven cannot be obtained apart from obedience to God, then logically, that obedience is a condition for getting there. So now we're adding conditions. We're adding conditions. In a sermon on Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, John MacArthur writes this. The life of God in the soul of man will always produce a righteous pattern. See, I would say... It should produce a righteous pattern, and it will if you sit under the proper teaching and if you line yourself up with the Word of God, but that doesn't always happen. Some people, they get saved, and they're not being taught the Word of God. They're going to some church that's giving them three points in a poem. They don't know right from left. They don't know anything, and they just go on in their ignorance. He says, if you have an unrighteous pattern in your life, you're fighting against the very nature God has created in you in salvation. It's like holding your breath. It's a lot harder than breathing. So he is saying here that, <laughs> that unrighteousness, acting sinful, is like holding your breath. It's hard. Really? Not to me. <laughs> it's easier to me. <laughs> you know, to me, it just seems to just jump out at times. I mean, I thank the Lord I got the Holy Spirit and I got my wife to keep me in check as what's right and what's wrong sometimes. But, you know... <laughs> Man, this is so ridiculous. Living a holy life, people, is not easy. Okay? It takes constant diligence. We must live in constant dependence upon God. We are to abide in Christ. But if you think it's hard to live unrighteously, mm. the Lordship View teaches that in order to be a Christian, you got to do more than believe the gospel. I see this as adding to the gospel. I see it as anathema. It is unbiblical. 
is not what the Bible teaches. All right, let's look at the grace view. This won't take long. Hang on. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this view teaches that a person becomes a Christian when they understand and believe the gospel. At that moment, you're placed in the body of Christ. You're given Christ's righteousness. You're indwelt by God. You're sure of heaven as if you were already there. Now, you just believe. You hadn't done anything. You hadn't had time to do anything yet. You just believe. Now, because God permanently indwells, His power is constantly available for the believer. But that power will not operate in the Christian's life unless he personally appropriates it by faith. Moment by moment, the believer must trust God rather than himself to give him the power for victory in daily life. The Christian life is not easy. It is a struggle because everything in the world is against what we believe, what we want, what we hope for, what we want to accomplish, and we have to persevere. We've got to depend on Christ to walk righteously, to walk holy. We're, there's temptations everywhere for us. God calls believers to be disciples, and this is the distinction I make. I think there is a distinction between a Christian and a and a disciple. A Christian is someone who's trusted Christ. A disciple is someone who's following Christ. There's a difference, people. But to follow Christ is costly. Salvation is a gift of God's grace, but discipleship costs you something. Salvation is our birth into the Christian life. Discipleship is our education and maturity in the Christian life. Eternal life is a gift of grace to all who believe. But notice what Luke says about discipleship. So therefore... Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, he can't be my disciple. See, discipleship is a call to forsake all and follow Christ. Can this be talking about the same thing as John 3.16? Is this the same as believing? Just because we're saved doesn't mean we can live as we please, all right? Please understand that. A lot of people say, oh, the free grace view, that's just saying you can sin up all you want and it doesn't matter. No! Grace is not a license to sin. It's not an excuse for carelessness in your Christian life. Remember this, people. Please remember this. Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Okay? So, as a Christian, your disobedience is not going to hurt your standing with God. Nothing can affect that standing, your position before God. But it's, it damages your practice. If your practice is sinful, it hurts a relationship, a fellowship with God. And He chastens those He loves. To live in sin will cost you temporally. I think the most miserable people on earth are people who are Christians living in sin. They just don't get it. They're wondering, why is my life so miserable? Why am I going through so much pain? Why do I hurt so bad? Why don't you live for the Lord? Because sin, any sin, all sin will cost us in this life. Look at Matthew 18. The Lord says, I forgave you all the debt. That's a Christian. God forgave him all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. His master delivered him to the jailer. So here's a Christian. He forgave him, but they're living in sin. They won't forgive another brother. So he turns him over to the jailers. This is a weak, this is a pitiful translation. The Greek here is basanestes, and it means torturers. Now, do you see a difference between a jailer and a torturer? I sure hope so. <laughs> okay. He handed them over to the torturers. So here we see one who has been forgiven, they're a believer, being turned over to the torturers because there's sin in their life. Now, God's not going to say, well, I'm going to kick you out of heaven, you're going to lose your salvation. No, I'm going to deal with you right now, son. You're going to get a good whipping. Verse 35 tells us that God will do the same to us if we live in sin. He says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. Now, what does he mean by handing him over to the tortures? What exactly is that? Well, I believe he's referring here to physical and mental pain that God brings upon his disobedient, 
sinning children. And let me tell you, people, sometimes the mental pain can be worse than the physical pain. There are consequences for a believer living in sin. Again, it will not affect your salvation, but it will greatly affect your quality of life here and now. God's not going to let you just, as his child, get away with stuff because he will discipline you. All right, let me ask you something. What is the most messed up church in the New Testament? Corinth. I think we'd all agree on that, right? Paul deals with many of their sins in the letters that he writes to them. But I want you to notice how he starts the letter. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Yeshua and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Yeshua. So those sanctified means those set apart in Christ. They're set apart. They're set apart for God. Then he says this, called to be saints. Literally, this is saints by calling. And you would scratch your head as you read this. Now, if you hadn't read the book before, you might be okay with this. But if you know the book, you're scratching your head saying, he calls them saints? I mean, the, Christ, the Corinthians were very divisive. They're living in immorality. Paul accuses them, you're doing things that Gentiles don't even think about. They were suing one another as Christians. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. Just to name a few of their sins. And he calls them saints? Is he crazy? Is this name it, claim it, hoping if I call you saints, maybe you'll start? No. They were saints. The word saints here is the adjective form of the verb, sanct verb sanctified, and it means to be set apart in the purpose and plan of God. The term saint is never associated with the quality of daily life, although that's how we most often use it. You know, we'll say, they're a saint, referring to their conduct. But the Bible uses saint to speak of every believer. All believers are saints. Positionally, we're holy. We're set apart. In practice, the Corinthians were gross sinners. But in position, they were saints. And they were saints because not how they live, but because they were called. This is a very significant statement. Don't miss it. The word called here means appointed to. We could translate this called to belong to Christ Yeshua. And in this letter, it's interesting that Paul never questions their salvation. He never says, you guys better check and make sure you're really saved. You're doing this stuff. I don't know if you can really be He never questions. He affirms it at the very beginning of the letter. And then he basically says, your saints act like it. Stop acting like this. You're Christians. Live righteously. All right. What if I'm wrong? <laughs> Which is always a very real possibility. Okay? Which is why I continually tell you to be Bereans. Don't believe what you hear. Search it out for yourself. See if it's true. But what if I'm wrong here? What if the free grace view is not correct? Let's think about this. If I'm, wrong, if I'm wrong, what damage could this view possibly cause? If the free grace view is wrong, it could cause people to think they're saved when they're not really saved, right? That's probably the only negative I could find on it. You know, you're saying you believe, they thought they believed, they didn't really believe because they never lived like it, so they're not really saved. So basically that would be saying I could be giving false hope to unbelievers, right? And my response to that is, so what? So what? Do you believe in election? We'll talk about this next week. But will the elect of God ever be lost? No. Will the reprobate ever be saved? No. So, who cares? In my opinion, the worst that the free grace view will do is give false hope to the reprobate. It's not affecting the church at all. All right? Now, if the lordship view is wrong, what harm can it do? Well, it causes a believer to think they're not really redeemed because they have sin in their life. And if you don't really think you are a Christian because you have sin in your life, and you believed, you thought you believed, and you're not making any... What's the point? See, this view can bring the elect under guilt and condemnation, and that's what it does. And it turns believers into Pharisees who sit in judgment on everybody else. You smoke cigarettes? You can't be a Christian. You cuss? You can't be... They have this arbitrary thing they come up, none of it's even biblical, that they make up, and they pronounce everybody unsaved. 
It causes a believer to give up on Christianity by making them doubt that they're really saved. If you don't think you're a Christian, what is your motivation for trying to live the Christian life? Notice what you should. So, in my view, free grace view gives false hope to the reprobate, which has nothing to do with the church. But the lordship view is hurting believers. It's damaging believers. Now, notice what Yeshua said about those who hurt his flock. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, Christians, to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck than to be drowned in the depth of the sea. So the Lord is saying, listen, don't hurt those who believe in me because there's going gonna, gonna to be judgment for that. Now, millstone, we don't use them too often today, right? Anybody got a millstone? <laughs> it was used for grinding grain or corn. Basically, every household had one. All right, big stone like this. Use, you put the grain in the, middle, in the center and you twirl this thing around and it smashes the grain. Okay? These things, they say, weighed probably between 75 and 100 pounds. So basically, how would you like to go swimming with that around your neck? You get the point from that, right? Okay? Well, you really don't get the point. Because this is way stronger than that. The Greek word used here for great millstone is mulas anakos. Okay? And it means a millstone belonging to a donkey. In other words, not the, the home millstone, the industrial one. Okay? <laughs> this is not your average. This is a large one that had to use an animal to pull it. So how would you like this one with that around your neck? Your chances of survival had just dropped drastically. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about this. When Yeshua spoke of a millstone hung around someone's neck and that person being cast into the sea, he was using an illustration that was contemporary to his time. All right? According to the Jewish historian Josephus, in his antiquities, Judas the Galilean, an early zealot leader who had led an insurrection, was drowned in a lake in this fashion. They stuck a millstone around his neck. I don't know if it was a mulas anakos, a millstone owned by a donkey. Probably not, because that'd be kind of hard to even throw that in the ocean, okay? But just put a millstone on and threw him in the water. The, his, the Roman historian, Suetonius, mentions a similar punishment being inflicted in another graphic case. So this is something contemporary to the time. When he's saying this, they're understanding. The disciples had seen drowned bodies from victims that were attached to millstones, so they get this. All right, what... Again, and if I'm saying something wrong here, I am open to the Scriptures. But to me, the Lordship view can hurt the church. And again, I say this from deep convictions because I was here. I know what this view did to me. I know that it turned me into a Pharisee, judging everybody on everything. And what was the line I judged myself on, other people on? It was always below me. In other words, I was always above the line. I'm okay. I, I mean, I do certain things, but not that. Okay? And so I didn't smoke, so anyone who smoked, psh, I didn't cuss. Anyone who cussed, psh, they didn't make it, you know? And again, like I said, too often it's not even on biblical things. But, you know, they see you do something, you can't be a Christian. Really? Christians can't do certain things? I had a friend who said something to me once way back that really struck with me. He said, a Christian can do anything a non-Christian can do except go to hell. I was like, Whew, that's true. If you know Christians, <laughs> you know they're capable of stuff, all right? Well, to me, the Lordship view hurts the church by causing Christians to live in guilt and doubt. How can I do this if I'm really a Christian? But the worst that the free grace view does is give the reprobate false hope. As I see it, only the Lordship view is really harmful to the church. Bottom line is we all need to admit that neither of these views change the destiny of the elect. But I really think that this strong push on lordship, and I understand they're trying to, they want the church to be holy. That's great. Encourage them to be holy. Don't try to change the scriptures. Don't try to make it part of their salvation. You bring guilt, you bring condemnation on believers who should be living a victorious life in Christ when they know the truth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for setting me free from the bondage of Lordship salvation. Lord, I, I can so remember the time when I just felt the huge weight lifted off my shoulders. 
I'm not a judge of the rest of the world. I don't have to sit in judgment on my fellow brothers and sisters. I just have to take them at their word. If they say they're a believer, I believe them. If they're not living righteously, I encourage them to do that. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, I pray that everyone who hears this, sitting here now listening or later by tape or podcast, whatever, Father, that they would not reject this, but they would search the Scriptures, Lord, to see if this is so. Is our salvation by grace through faith alone? Then that's it. And we're saved because you're a loving God. We're called to obedience, Lord. And if we're not obedient, you'll definitely chasten us. But I thank you, Lord, that I'm yours and I always will be yours, no matter what happens in this life. Oh, assurance is such a blessing, Father. Thank you for your grace to me. Amen. You know, without assurance, it's very difficult to live the Christian life. Because it's difficult to live the Christian life, and why should you try if you don't even think you're a Christian? Questions? Comments? Gary? <laughs> well, a common argument is um, that I've heard before is if you confess with your mouth Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you be saved. So there's, there is a condition there that I've heard right. people say. And the next verse says, talk strictly only about believing. <laughs> you know, so that's again the context here. Now, listen, this. This question comes up every single time I talk about this, okay? So this is, wow, I'm not shocked by this at all. Please explain the question regarding the demons believe. They're not believers, why? Because they're unredeemable. Christ did not die for demons, all right? And, and again, what we're talking about here is James chapter 2. And every time I talk about this, people say, what about James 2? Mm -hmm. I've got messages on the internet, on our website, on James 2. Please go and listen to them, okay? The issue there is salvation, all right? Mm -hmm. Can that faith save you? That is an addition. It's not in the Greek. It simply says, can faith save you? And it's talking about not salvation etern in the sense of eternal life. He is, James is asking, can faith save you from the damaging effects of sin? In other words, because you believe, can you live however you want and it won't damage you? This whole James argument is turned on its head. So I would encourage you, I don't have time to get into all that right now, but I appreciate that question because it comes up all the time. Demons are unredeemable. It doesn't matter if they believe or not. Christ didn't die for demons. He died for humanity. He became a man to die for men. But that text in James, again, is, is really a misunderstood text. If you don't understand what he's talking about, it's going to be confusing. What is John MacArthur's view of his own salvation? You know, I've never heard John question his salvation, but John Piper, on the other hand, who is another lordship proponent, mm -hmm. I've heard Piper say, if after 50 years of serving God, I did this, I would not know if I'm going to heaven. I'm like, wow, how does that guy live constantly questioning, am I in, am I out, am I in, am I out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, lordship is, it's a damaging position. All right. Uh, question here from Chris. He says, can you speak the two verses I've heard used to support lordship view? Romans 10, <laughs> Romans 9, 10. If you confess with your mouth Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In Hebrews 12, 14, strive for peace without everyone, holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Listen, I can't deal with every one of these verses. I know there's verses, but if you go... Again, go online in Romans 9. I dealt with those verses when I taught through that. And the same thing with Hebrews. Go on there. I, I dealt with those verses when I taught through them. This is the thing. This, this keeps raising. What about this verse? What about this verse? If there weren't verses like this that caused you to scratch your head, there probably wouldn't be a lordship position. Okay? The reason people hold different positions, they all think they have verses to fit them. Of course. All right? I'm just saying we have to take the whole view of it and say, how does this fit in with that? And can we understand this view and what he's saying here? All right? 
I don't think you have to say, Jesus is Lord to be a Christian. Okay? Homiligao, confess, means to agree with another. So if you agree with God on who Christ is, you're a Christian. Okay? It's not, you know, going in front of the thing, and I want to confess today that I'm a Christian. No, that's not what it's talking about. All right? Homiligao, to agree with another, and that another being God. All right? Again, I, I'd encourage you, please, just go look these verses up, you know, in my study on, J on the things I did on James, on Romans. You can get the answers there because I don't want to short circuit this. I want you to get a full, I want you to get the full understanding there as I deal with those verses. But I just, you know. You could turn the volume down. People who don't know how to use their phones. <laughs> we could have a... <laughs> okay. Another question. Hello. I'm viewing your sermon from L.A., California. Sorry. Get rid of Newsom. You'll be better off for it, okay? Can we enjoy heaven while our loved ones are in hell? Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be the fifth message in this series on Berean Distinctives. All right, so in order to answer that, if you want that answered thoroughly, four weeks from now, four weeks from now, I'll be giving you the answer to that question as we talk about the doctrine of hell. Okay? Um, he says, the thief on the cross is unexplainable to the lordship mentality. Yeah, that's true, he is. You know, he, he didn't get the... Getting, didn't get to do his works, so all he got to do was believe. There's a lot of things I get against that. Bill says, good stuff, brother. Thanks. Appreciate it, Bill. Appreciate you watching. Um, I think I got all the questions that have come in. Did you have something, Jeff? Oh, go ahead. I love the devil. <laughs> Just... Um... It was, you know, we were just chatting in the back of the So, you know, you asked about obedience, like how much obedience is required. Right. Okay. But I believe you have to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. How much? How much do I got to believe? Well, I think I tried to cover that today. You have to believe that Christ is the guarantee of eternal life. That's what you're believing him for. Yeah, he promised he'll give you eternal life. I don't think you have to understand everything about Christ. Mm -hmm. No. I think you simply have to understand that he is... A guarantee of eternal life. I overcome the grave. I'll overcome it from you if you put your trust in me. He said he'll give us eternal life if we believe him for eternal life. You know, people say, we well, have to believe in the virgin birth. I don't know you have to do all that stuff. Okay? When you come to Christ, you might not understand many things at all. All right? Might, your understanding might be very little. But you're trusting God to do what he said he would do, which he would give you life everlasting. That's, to me... I, I think we add too many things to the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that's added to the gospel now is eschatology. <laughs> okay, you've got to have a correct eschatology or you're not, you know. And no, it can be any eschatology. It just can't be preterism. <laughs> okay. Preterism is the only damnable eschatology. Everything, And I'm like, how did that get added to the gospel? How do you put that in? So basically, I mean, I want to make this as simple as possible. Saving faith is believing the promise that God said, if you trust me, I can give you eternal life. I have that ability to do that. That's what faith is. It's believing that God has the ability to give me life forever. Because he said he would. Does that require knowledge of who God is, what eternal life is, what a Christ is? No, again, I don't think you have to go into all the... De I don't think you have to understand the Trinity. I don't think you have to understand a lot of things. You're just trusting him. Now, why are you trusting him? Because he said these things and you believe it because, listen... The reason you believe, again, we're going to get into this next time, but the reason you believe is because God has given you life. See, dead people can't believe the gospel. So God, and that's why salvation is of God. We're dead, we're walking around dead men, and God comes and boom, gives you life. You're going to hear, if God has given you life, you're going to hear, you're going to believe the gospel. It's all of God. Amen. Now we want to argue about what do they have to believe? It's simple. Okay, it's simple. We don't have to add a lot of things. I don't think they have to know all the doctrines of God, all the doctrines of the Trinity, all the doctrines of Christ. Now, 
as you grow and you learn those things, that's going to be very beneficial to your life. I mean, the more I come to know God, it's just, it's so humbling, you know, that he's who he is and he would love me the way I was. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Well, right. If you're living accordingly, okay. But that's okay. I guess you can have the life you're saved. You have it, but you're right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. That, and see, that's my point. They're saying, if you're saved, you will. Live. And here's the dis- here's the distinction I make with MacArthur. Righteousness is imputed. It is not imparted. Okay, if righteousness was imparted, you ever seen the old commercial, the guy on the, the white knight on the thing, boom, points the sword, and oh, everything's white and clean and nice. Okay, that's, that's imparted. In other words, God imparted righteousness, so I'm just, uh, everything's righteous. It's imputed. In other words, God looked at my account, he said, debt is paid in full, this man is righteous. Not because you look at me, that's my position, again. Now, my practice sometimes is very different. It doesn't change my position. Cheryl. What's he just talking about when he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God? Right. He's talking about himself. He's, He's talking about, about Christ's righteousness. That's the whole thing. Unless you, because any righteousness that we have on our own. Right. See, the, right, the Pharisees, they were big hypocrites, but they thought they were the most righteous, okay? And in a sense, they tried to live up to the law of God. But he's saying it has to exceed that. It's not something you can do. You have to have Christ's righteousness. There's no way, I don't care how good you are, how many deeds you do, how loving and kind and whatever you are, you can't make it. You need perfect obedience. And only Christ did it, and we're in Him, and our union puts us. Listen, people, here's what you have to understand. Here's your mantra you say in the mirror every morning. I am as righteous as Christ. Now, if that bothers you, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Because that's your position. And because you say that I'm as righteous as Christ, it should motivate you, I want to live for Christ. I want to live up to who I am. I want my practice to match my identity. I'm as righteous as Yeshua the Christ. And I have as much chance of losing my salvation as Christ has been kicked out of the Trinity. And until he gets kicked out, I'm secure. Go ahead. There's nothing more important to me than this. Okay? Okay, so the purpose of us is to be image bearers so that others can see, not so much what John is saying, so that we can polish ourselves up for God. We're already polished. Yeah. It's for others. It's for, that's, the, that's the reason we're image bearers, to bear to the world the image of Christ. They want to see Him in us. It's not for us, but we're to live righteously because, listen, righteous living is a blessing. This is what God calls us to. And when you live the way he wants you to, there's just tremendous blessing, okay? Tremendous victory. Because sin is damaging. It's not like God says, I'm mean, I don't want you to have fun. Sin's fun, so I'm going to keep you from... No. Sin damages people. Righteousness just it blesses everybody around you, okay? And it doesn't... When I say, you know, God's going to bless you, I don't mean everything's going to come up roses. You might be in a miserable situation like Paul in jail praising God. The thing is, when your attitude is right, it doesn't matter where you are. Okay? Did I see a hand over here? I see that hand all over the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying that um, I read the uh, biography of Martin Luther and he was a monk and right. he was constantly punishing himself mm-hmm. for sins that he committed all the time mm-hmm. because he never thought he was good enough and it wasn't mm-hmm. until I think he was climbing up the stairs on his knees or something when when it hit him. Salvation is of grace. You know, what am I doing all of these things for? It was so cool, you know. Yeah, his the testimony of Martin Luther is amazing, you know. He he was a monk, he taught the scriptures every week, you know, he had a doctorate and you know, and if he was going through Romans and it just hit him. It's by faith. And he woke up, and, you know, he, he rocked the world once he woke up. He posted a 95 thesis on the castle church door in Wittenberg, and it just, boom. And what's amazing is all the reformers in different places, Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, Cramner, 
they all believed the same things. Mm -hmm. They were in different countries, and they're all, at the, at the same time the Reformation's happening, they're pushing the same beliefs, and they never heard of Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. God worked. Yeah. When did Calvin come along? <laughs> when did Calvin come along? I mean, what, was he contemporary of Luther? No, no, Luther was in the third century. Calvin is not till, what year is it? I don't know. I don't know, uh, 15s? I'm sorry, we're talking about a different thing. My question was, was Martin Luther, before he realized grace, was he Christian? Because he believed in Christ. <laughs> no, he, the well, he, he didn't believe. Him. That's the thing. He believed, he was trusting his works, not what Christ did. But he still, he still believed in Christ and his father sent him and he all that. Yeah, but he, ta he, again, he's trusting himself. And that's what a lot of people are at today. They're trusting, I believe in Jesus, they would say. I believe in him, but I trust my works. I have to do this. So you're, it's a, no, it's Christ alone. That's what saves people, Christ alone. All right, anybody else? Thanks so much for asking the question on James chapter 2. It had to come up. What about James? Just to understand what James is talking about, it makes a lot more sense. All right, we're done. Everybody got it? Everybody got it? We're clear, we're clear. We're clear as we can clear as we can be. Okay, this is an important stuff. This is why I start with this one, because to me, of, the, of our distinctives, this is the most important. And if you're looking for a church and people say, struggle, what do I look for in a church? To me, this would be the most important thing, that they're teaching free grace. They're not constantly condemning you as a Christian because you're not doing what you think you should do, and therefore you might not even be saved. Very important. Let's, all right, I'm just going to close in prayer now because ah, I went a little bit over. So, <laughs> Father, thank you for your grace to us, Lord. It is incredible. It is amazing. Thank you so much that it has nothing to do with us. We'd mess it up, Lord, so bad. Thank you for your grace to us. Help us, Lord. I pray for your people, that you would help us to understand what you have done for us, what you have given us, and that our life will be motivated to live for you out of gratitude, not out of fear, but out of gratitude for your gracious love for us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Amen.